you automatically think of something bad. Disgust describes your feelings or something or someone you don't like. Everyone at one time or another finds something disgusting. Just because broccoli is disgusting doesn't mean all vegetables are disgusting. Just because someone doesn't like chocolate cake doesn't mean all desserts are nasty. Just because someone looks hateful when you first meet them doesn't mean they're not a kind-hearted person. Everyone has their idea of what, what is disgusting. Just because one thing is disgusting does not mean everything is disgusting. We continue this week our sermon series, Inside Out, based on the Pixar, Disney's Pixar movie, Inside Out. 
we have had excellent guest preachers and uh and worshiped with our annual conference over the last few weeks and now we head into our the last two sundays of our inside out series this Sunday, we are focusing on the emotion disgust. Um, we have focused on joy. We have focused on sadness and anger and fear. And today we center our attention toward disgust. Can I tell you something? I love broccoli. Yeah, I do. And when Riley, the 11 year old in the movie, uh, turns out to, to hate broccoli, it disgusts her. That hurt my feelings a little bit because I love broccoli probably as much or more than Riley disgusts it. Isn't our life like that sometimes? <laughs> People, um, some people love what we hate and it gets on our nerves because we don't understand why they don't hate it. And some people hate what we love and it drives us insane because they don't um, love what we love. But God has something to say about disgust as well for us this week. This week, we look toward the minor prophet, one of the 12 minor prophets, Amos. If you have your Bible with you, if it's a paperback Bible or hard copy Bible, then you'll want to go towards the end of the Old Testament, past Psalms, um, actually just a little bit before Matthew, before um, the New Testament begins. If you're using electronic version of the Bible, you can just type in AM and Amos will pop up for you. We're going to Amos chapter 5 today. Amos was a migrant farm worker and he was a part of the nation Judah, which thought that it was most holy of all of the nations of Israel. The Israelites have been in the wilderness for 40 years. They have come out of exile and they are living in ways that their ancestors would not have been able to imagine. But the Israelites still aren't understanding what it means to follow God. Now, they've had an opportunity to follow God out of slavery into exile and out of exile into abundant life, but they still don't understand what God wants from them. Here's the twist. They think they've got it down. They think that they understand exactly what they are supposed to do. And God uses Amos to let them know that they've got it wrong. I don't know about you, but the last thing I want to hear from God is that the way that I am doing things, the way that I think about things, the way that I want to live my life is not pleasing to God, especially when I've convinced myself that I am right. So here we are with the Israelites who know that they are right. And God decides to use Amos to turn their worlds right side up. So here we are in Amos, the fifth chapter. I'm going to be skipping around a little bit, but I invite you to read Amos. It's a short book. You can handle it. Read Amos sometime over this week and so that you can get the full context of what's going on here as we learn and grow together. So I'll begin in Amos chapter five in the fourth verse. God's message to the family of Israel. Now, friends, I'm reading from the a translation of the Bible called the message. God's message of the family of Israel. Seek me and live. So seek God and live. You don't want to end up 
with nothing to show for your life, but a pile of ashes, a house burned to the ground. For God will send such a fire and the firefighters will show up too late. In the 10th verse, people hate this kind of talk. Raw truth is never popular. But here it is, bluntly spoken, because you run roughshod over the poor and take the bread right out of their mouths, you're never going to move into those luxury homes that you have built. You're never going to drink wine from the expensive vineyards you plant you planted. I know precisely the enormity of your sin. You bully right living people. And you kick the poor when they are down. But justice is not a lost cause. But it seems the way you live that justice is a lost cause. Evil is epidemic. Decent people throw up their hands, protest and rebuke are useless. A waste of breath. So seek good and not evil, and live. You talk about God, the God of the angel armies. You talk about God being your best friend. Well, live like it, and maybe it will happen. Hate evil and love good, then work it out in the public square. Maybe God, the God of the angel armies, will notice your remnant and be gracious. I can't stand your religious meanings, says the Lord. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religious projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? Says the Lord. I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. Now hear that last verse, Amos 5, 24, again from the more familiar New Revised Standard Version. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. May God add a blessing to the reading and the doers of God's word. Let us pray. Lord, here we are to worship, here we are to bow down, here we are to say that you are indeed our worthy and our holy God. So fall fresh on us, O oh Lord, fall fresh on us, open our hearts and our minds and our souls and our hands and our feet, open us, O oh God, to receive the word that you have for us today. So take this, your servant, and hide her behind that old rugged cross so that when you speak, oh God, people will hear you and not me. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your way. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So in Disney Pixar's Inside Out, remember that Riley is an 11 year old girl who moves from Minnesota where she's lived all of her life. She and her family moved to San Francisco for her father's new job. Riley is usually a happy-go-lucky 11-year-old who just goes with the flow and not much ruffles her feathers. In fact, joy leads her life. She finds a way to turn things that are difficult into joy. But this move, 
This move is harder than anyone could have imagined. And this move threatens to steal her joy and leaves her with overwhelming fear and raging anger and sadness that is just hard to talk about. Disgust rules the day. I don't know about you, but when we encounter the emotions in the movie Inside Out, the last thing I want to do is to hold up a mirror to myself and to think about all of the ways in which I let my emotions lead me. Yes, you know, we're supposed to be led by God. The people of God are to be led by the Holy Spirit. But sometimes our humanness gets in our way and our humanity takes over. And sometimes we veer off course a little bit. This is what has happened to the Israelites in Amos's uh, text for us today. And they've gotten so far off course that they think that what they are doing is honoring God. And, and they bask in it. They, they tell everybody that they are so righteous that they worship God in such a way that they have all their religious festivals and they do all of the ritual things just right. They worship in the temples that have been built and they push back on anyone who would want to worship anywhere else thinking that God could be bound by a box. They bring their sacrifice to God. But the problem is that God is fed up. Because their worship and the way that they lead their lives, it's not about worshiping God. It's about showing everybody else how holy they are. Now, this is a hard message to receive, especially for those of us who have been going to Sunday school since we were in diapers and attending worship services when we were in our parents' womb. It's so hard to think that we could be doing everything right and that God could still not be pleased with us. You know, when people get in our way, we have a choice how to respond. When people disagree with us, we have a choice how to respond. When God calls us on the mat and says, look, this thing is not right in your life, we have a choice. Either we seek to understand or we seek to be understood. Either we find a way to live together in peace and joy and justice and harmony. Or we pick at each other until there is nothing left to pick apart. You know, I think the definition of disgust is something that makes us uncomfortable or something that we just want to avoid. We are disgusted by foods that we don't like to eat. We are disgusted by people that we don't know and we don't understand. We are disgusted by opinions that we don't hold. We are disgusted by leaders who don't look like us or think like us. We are in a 
series, a place of disgust in our nation where we can't even get along with each other because we're so disgusted by each other. Riley is disgusted by broccoli. So much so that she does everything she can to avoid it. And when she arrives in San Francisco and the nearest place to eat is a pizza place, she gets a little excited. But when she realizes that the pizza place only serves one kind of pizza and it's broccoli pizza, she decides that all of San Francisco is the most terrible thing that she could experience. I wonder how many of us are like that. You don't have to admit it. We are sometimes the kind of people that throw the baby out with the bathwater just because we are disgusted by what we see, what we hear, and what people do. You know, if we leave disgust unchecked, we can allow it to steal our joy. If we let disgust take over in our lives, we will miss seeing God in the midst of everything that is going on in our lives. Living in a place of disgust or a place that is led by disgust, we have, we can fall victim to the opportunity to worship for the sake of worship. Just the ritual of it, because we're used to it. This is what we do every day. Clergy are finding out during this season in the life of our world during the coronavirus that some congregants are more concerned about the space that they worship in than the health and well-being of the people that we are supposed to be calling into the worship of God. I, I know that's not you, Atlanta first, but, but let's just stay here for a minute because the Amos text is teaching us the very same thing. It is saying to us, don't get so distracted by the rhythm of things or by the look of things that you miss the point of things. God says in, in the text, I can't stand your religious festivals, your gathering of meetings, because the meeting is no longer about worshiping the most high God in spirit and in truth, but it has become about worshiping in ways that I feel comfortable singing the songs that I want to sing, doing things the way I want to do them so that I can check this off my list and God might be pleased with me. Hmm. Ouch. That hurts. God said in Amos, I'm tired of your public gatherings because you talk like you do the right thing, but your actions miss the mark. Have you ever been so disgusted with someone or something they did that you allow that disgust to cloud everything else that you see from that person. You, you hear their words through a certain lens and you see their behavior through a certain lens and you impose your disgust on them. This message is an invitation To let God lead. To see 
the way that God sees, to act the way that God expects, to worship because God is worthy to be praised and not because it's something you've been doing your whole life. The text says that what God wants from us is justice and righteousness. What, what, what do you mean, preacher? God, does God want my attendance? Yeah, but a building doesn't bind God. We are to live a lifestyle of worship. But I've been faithful. I've put my tithes and offering in the church every year. I go to Sunday school every Sunday. I go to worship every Sunday. I've been faithful. Yeah, by human standards. But Amos is teaching us that God expects our behavior to reflect our faith. <laughs> you know, when Riley, when joy leaves Riley's control panel and sadness leaves Riley's control panel in the movie Inside Out, what we learn is that disgust and fear and anger cannot try to be something that they are not. But fear and anger don't seem to, that doesn't seem to click for fear and anger. They seem to have lost their way. They seem to have been mistaken about how they do things. They seem to think that they can keep things running without joy, who is the leader of the group. In fact, fear and anger push disgust to the front and they say, say something that joy would say, be like joy. Disgust warns them that she cannot be joy. But they keep insisting, so she tries anyway, and she says what she thinks Joy would say, but it comes out in a disgustful manner. And when fear and anger look at her when she has followed their rules and say, why did you say it like that? She responds, I told you. I cannot be joy. One of the things we learn in the movie is that disgust has boundaries. Fear has a harder time keeping boundaries and anger has an even harder time keeping boundaries and sadness. Well, she just goes around touching stuff that she's not supposed to touch. But disgust seems to know that she needs to stay in her lane, that she has a purpose and that she cannot operate outside of that purpose. Thanks be to God. <laughs> so how are we to manage disgust in our lives? Well, friends, first we have to identify disgust in our lives. Sometimes disgust shows up as apathy. Just going along to get along, but not really caring about anything at all. Remember that Jesus says that to be lukewarm, you might as well not be anything. You spit lukewarm out. Unfortunately, that's where many of our churches in the United States lean now. We lean toward apathy. We don't want the preacher to say anything that would upset us or, or jangle us a little bit. We don't want people to sit in our seat. We don't want things to change. We want a pat on the shoulder and a pat on the back because we check the thing off the list and we want to call it faithful. 
<clears throat> Disgust always shows up, also shows up in our thoughts and in our words. When we are fighting to get back in the church building, but not fighting for the people who are dying each and every day because of racial and societal injustices in our world. Disgust shows up when we see a Black Lives Matter banner and we want to tack on it all lives matter because we miss the point that all people aren't being bludgeoned to death. All people aren't starting behind the, the start line that all people don't have the kind of in a racial historical racial injustices toward them as black people. Disgust shows up when we see certain politicians and we don't really listen to their words. We make up our own opinions without even checking to see if our sources are right. Disgust shows up when we want comfort to come first and everything else to come after that. I bet the Israelites kept wondering why God was bringing such a hard message to them. And, and I think we might have the same wonderings. Then as now, God is seeking to arrest us, to stop us dead in our tracks and to say, I love you. I want you to love everyone the same way you love yourself and your comfort and having your own way. And I expect more from you. What I want from you is not your empty rituals, but what I want from you are for you to be a person that seek and live as justice seeking people and that seek and live as righteous people of God. And that you cannot do this without your behavior. Your words mean nothing. Your behavior is everything. Some of my favorite theologians have said things about this text that like apathy needs irritating. That no one wants to hear the words that prophets speak. That perhaps Amos is reminding us that justice and righteousness are not luxuries to be relished in good times, but are essential elements. God says, seek me, <laughs> seek me because I know through disgust, you will gain apathy and in apathy, you will want to move to comfort. And when comfort leads, you allow things that interrupt your comfort to become disgust and disgust blinds us to the opportunity and the voice of God saying, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Justice means making sure that what is right, not our definition of right, but right in the eyes of God always comes before wrong. And righteousness, righteousness means always doing the best for someone else. The only way to overcome disgust is through the actions of justice and righteousness. 
The only way to overcome disgust is to expect and work for justice to roll down like water and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. The only way to overcome disgust in our hearts and our minds and our souls in our actions and in our behavior is to ensure that we don't stop at our comfort level, but we make sure that everyone has access to the same things we have access to, that people can eat and people can live and people can actually get interviews at jobs because they, nobody stops them because they are of some ethnic background that we don't want to hire. Just today, (laughs) I I went on a trip and what I saw through the lens of justice and righteousness, because I kept hearing Amos in my head, I saw that in in wealthy neighborhoods that the gas prices were 20 cents cheaper than they were in poverty stricken neighborhoods. Friends, that's not justice. That's not righteousness. So I invite you to work to overcome disgust today. I invite you to listen, to see things in a way that you don't see them or you don't hear them. I invite you to sit back, wait for the Lord, worship the Lord in spirit and in truth and then be led to justice and righteousness from there. Disgust can blind you from the opportunities God has given us and the movement of the Holy Spirit. But disgust can be overcome. It can be overcome by justice and righteousness. You know, I told you when we started that broccoli is my favorite vegetable and I was just taken aback that Riley didn't like broccoli. But the truth of the matter is that there was a time that I was disgusted by broccoli. I was disgusted by all the green things because I wanted to eat candy and cake and sugary stuff. But one day I approached broccoli with a clean slate, not expecting it to be bad, not expecting it to be good, but just to try again. And guess what? After that try, I love broccoli. The Lord said, what I want from you is justice, oceans of it. What I want from you is righteousness, rivers overflowing of it. So to overcome disgust, we are to act justly and to live in righteousness, working for the good of all of God's people, even if it means that I don't get to the front of the line. Overcome disgust. I dare you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Friends, receive this benediction today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord make you uncomfortable. May the Lord remind you to seek God and live. And may the Lord give you ways to practice justice and practice righteousness so that they might roll down like waters and flow like an ever flowing stream. Now to the one who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the most high God, be all honor, glory, and praise now and forevermore. And the people of God sang. Amen.